As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There's a better way to create a website, a professional, crisp website you'll be proud to publish, and it just takes seconds. This is all thanks to Hostinger's AI website generator. I recently took this for a test drive, even shared this on my YouTube channel. It was mind-blowing. Not just how quick you can build a website, but with the AI, how great it actually can write copy for you. You can use the AI logo maker, plus it got it up in no time, and it looks good. Absolutely mind-blowing. So if you want to build a website, go to Hostinger, because they're a top, highly-rated global web hosting platform. And all you have to do to build a website is just answer three questions and let the AI do all the work for you. You can build as many web pages as you need without knowing how to code a single line of anything. They have great support, too. That was one thing that I had a problem with with a with a with another host back in the day. Hostinger has 24-7 support and a library of video guides. And here's the thing. You can do this for less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. That is crazy. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast, you can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name, H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R.com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. Give it a spin. Who is anybody to do anything? Everyone had to start somewhere. And at the end of the day, the way I look at it is, I don't think people care if you're an expert or not. I think only you care. Like, so when you're like, who am I to do this? It's a very narcissistic question. If I'm going to be honest, you're, you're looking inward at like, gosh, I'm not good enough. And I need to be an expert. I think you'll get further in life. If you stop looking at yourself and instead look at how could I serve somebody? Could I help somebody? Welcome to the smart passive income podcast, where it's all about working hard now. So you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, Dim sum is one of his favorite foods to eat out with friends, Pat Flynn. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30-day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. That was Graham Cochran, who, when he was in college, was really set on becoming a musician. And unfortunately, things didn't go as planned. He had to get a job that he didn't like, and he even started living off of food stamps for a while. But he was able to make it turn around. And in this podcast episode, you're going to hear Graham's story and also how he became a really successful musician, but in a different kind of way, using YouTube and online courses. It's going to be a really inspirational story. In fact, a lot of his story um, parallels my own story, and even in the timeline as well. 
And hopefully this will be an amazingly inspirational and motivational episode for you to listen to. Graham also teaches a lot of people how to do business now because so many people were asking him how he did it. And we're going to understand how he does it today. We also do a little role playing because he's a business coach. I like to put people on the spot sometimes and actually put them through a scenario and see how they would lead somebody through a particular scenario. And we go through that here as well. So Graham Cochran, who you can find at GrahamCochran.com. He also has a book, which we'll talk about in the middle of the episode. I hope you enjoy this. It should be a lot of fun and also super, super educational. Graham, welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thank you so, so much for being here today. Oh man, it's an honor. I'm excited about this. I'm excited too, because I know that you have been involved with generating passive income and helping others make a living online as well. And we'll get into that for sure. But I want to get into you and your origin story. I'm told that you have uh, come from a long way to, to get to where you're at today. Like where, where did this journey really start for you? Yeah, it started with music for me. Um, my dream was to be a full-time musician. I wanted to make music videos on MTV, which is, it's not a thing, <laughs> thing anymore, really. So <laughs> that kind of dates me, but I wanted to be a rock star. And um, I was always on the stage, either in theater and music. And so that was my trajectory. Um, I actually really took a hard swing at trying to make that a reality um and had some mentors what does a hard swing out. mean in, in that world yeah like all my friends wanted to be rock stars and then they all started to drop off as like they realized well, i, I want to get a real job and i want to have money and so they got more serious about a career and i i was like holding out like nope i don't want to have a career other than music so for me that mm -hmm. was making records making demos trying to get things pitched to record labels all through college um wow. yeah i mean i really i thought it was going to happen so like i had no plan b <laughs> so I went I went hard. Did, were you a, a singer, guitar player, or, or a particular instrument? Yeah, singer, songwriter, and guitar player. So I did the rock band stuff. I'm a big '90s grunge, you know, Soundgarden, yeah. Sentimental Pilot. That's nice, my world. Dude. Oh yes, yes, that's what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Uh, and, and so, okay, so that's your dream. You're submitting samples and and demos, I, I imagine. And and does it just not take off? Like, what's going through your mind when maybe it's not going the way you thought it was? Yeah, like the agreement with my family was my parents and grandfather had saved money for college. So they were all like, you're going to college. Right. Whatever you do after that, we don't care. So I realized there's a whole industry of audio engineering and producing. And so you could actually get a degree and hang out in a recording studio at school. And so I thought that was a fair compromise. I'll go get a degree. I'll play in the studio. I'll learn more. I was interested in music recording and technology even back in the day. So I thought that'd be fun and I could learn some stuff. But my mm -hmm. secret mission was make a bunch of records, get, you know, take songwriting classes, shop things around. And by the time I graduate, have a record deal um, and when that wasn't starting to happen in the, in my senior year and it was, it seemed like every conversation was like, yeah, this is okay. Or you, we, we like you, we'll sign you, but we're not going to pay you. And it was like deals that weren't uh -huh. really deals. They're just like, you know, no risk on their part. I realized I got to get a job and this is, this is not how I thought it was going to go. So that, and plus I was engaged to be married. And so I was like, crap, I got to actually yeah. provide something. So that was the beginning of a, a sad series of like three to four years where I was like, sort of drifting and like figuring out what's my next step. What was your next step? Did you get a job? And, and if so, what was that job? I sold radio advertising for a local radio station uh, okay. in a small town. And that was awful. I realized early on that I was awful at sales. Go figure I now sell for a <laughs> living, but I was awful at that. <laughs> and then uh, I ended up transitioning into, I worked at a jewelry store for a while. And then I transitioned into working at a software company um, called Rosetta Stone, where they teach foreign language um, stuff. And I was an audio engineer for them. So I would sit in a booth and just press record. And it would be like, you know, El Gato. We'd bring the guy in and he would just say all the phrases in Spanish. And I would just, it was the most boring. It was a cool company, oh, boring job. And I did that for a few years um, until really, till the, the global recession, 2009, we made our way down to Tampa, where we are now, lost two jobs that year had our first baby, bought our first house. So, and then, then we lost the jobs after that. Uh, and that's where I found myself like, I've got to find a way to make a living. And my only skill I had from the audio engineering days was freelance recording and mixing bands. So I was doing that on the side. Um, I just, it was just for fun and for extra money. But that's when yeah. I started to try to find out how can I ramp this up? And that was the beginning of my, my business journey. Oh, amazing. I mean, it sounds very similar to my story, having gotten laid off, after getting engaged and having a plan a not going to work and then kind of just wondering what was going to happen next and then you know uh, many people know my story of building an architecture website to help serve those people and that kind of took off when did 
you find that you were on a new path in life that you thought maybe this might be the way I'm going to go? Yeah. So when I moved to Tampa, I didn't know anybody. So in, this is the way my brain worked. I thought, how am I going to get clients locally if I don't know anybody? I'm, I'm going to okay. try to connect and network. But what if I could, because I could do remote work, I could produce records remotely, people record it somewhere, send it to me, I, I could finish it. So I thought if I get on the internet and have a blog, eventually I started a YouTube channel. It was just like lead generation for a freelance business is what I thought. I, and I had no mm. strategy other than people are going to Google stuff. So I might as well try to show up there uh, and maybe they'll see what I'm doing with what little client work I did have. Um, and maybe they would hire me. And what that turned into was people liking the content, people mm -hmm. liking that I was explaining things to them in a way, explaining a very technical skill. And this is kind of your, your world, explaining a technical skill in a way that's easy to understand. Um, right. And people are like, oh my gosh, can you please make more videos? Can you please do more blog posts? And I was like, sure, as long as I'm not in a gig, but I need to make money off of this. So that was, that, what was interesting was the first time I realized I was building a bit of an audience and there was a hunger for this stuff. And that's when my head started to swirl. And I didn't know, I didn't know you existed back then. I didn't know anybody existed. And I was like, how do people make money off of their content? That was the question. And yeah. that's, that started me on the path of, you know, trying to figure out ads, sponsorships, and then eventually stumbled into digital courses. That's really cool. What was the content that you were creating about that people started to know you for? Yeah, so I, I decided to, my target market was people who were going to record their music either themselves or in a studio and then they didn't feel comfortable finishing it. Like We'd call it mixing and mastering. So yeah. I thought I could educate them on the recording side since I mm -hmm. saw the shift in the, in the industry, much like cameras got cheaper and digital and people could become photographers for cheaper. Same thing that was happening in audio in the early 2000s. So I was like, dude, I, I know all my music friends are so confused about equipment and gear and how to use it. So I, I, make, I made educational videos on what to buy, how to use it, um, and then, and then the, the techniques of how to actually make your music sound professional. And I thought that it would be kind of like, uh, if you ever watched one of those Frank Kern ads where he's like showing you how to create a funnel and you're like, this is really complicated. I'm just going to hire you to do it kind of thing. Like I thought yeah. I would complicate people or they would just see that it's hard and then they would hire me, but they were hungry to do it themselves, which like I was. And so I yeah. realized, man, I'm kind of championing them and empowering them and they don't want to hire me, but they want to learn from me. That's interesting. So you're giving away all this amazing free content. You are building a name for yourself in this space, helping people with their uh, mastering, but you have to make money somewhere, right? Yeah. So where eventually did you lead into to eventually start generating an, an income from the audience that you were building? Yeah, I mean, I started with some sponsored posts and like banner ads on my website and some manufacturers and stuff like that. Um, but when I, I, the light bulb hit me, right? When I decided to teach a piece of software in the studio we use called Pro Tools. It's kind of like the Photoshop of the music yeah. world. And um, it confuses people. And I feel like I was pretty good at explaining it to my friends. And so I thought I could teach start to finish, like how to, how to like look at the software and use it and feel comfortable in it. But it's going to take me mm. three to four hours walking them through it virtually. So I can't just post, I think YouTube back then, this is 2010, YouTube would only allow me like 15 minute video uploads. Yeah. So I was like, this is gonna be a lot of YouTube videos. I was like, what if I just film it and put it in a zip file and like come up with a PayPal link and use iWeb on my Mac and make a little site and like just email my baby little list. And I don't even know why I knew about building an email list, but somehow I knew, well, thank God I did. Um, and I, I decided to sell it and I just, everyone else was selling courses for like 19 bucks back then in, in the music space. Mm -hmm. So I sold it for $45 because I thought it'd be, it was way better than all those other ones because they were very yeah. boring. And, uh, and somebody bought it. And that was insane to me that somebody paid me $45 and they got a digital download. And then I was like, oh my gosh, like that's not much money, <laughs> but this could happen again and again and again. And so for me, as someone who I would say is not entrepreneurial by nature, that was the moment that I started to see the vision of, oh my gosh, this could actually be something. And by something I was hoping like two grand a month so I could maybe freelance two grand a month, make two grand on the digital side and I would be a happy camper. <laughs> so. Yeah, so tell me what happened next. I mean, you had that first sale for 45, you're feeling stoked. Were there any feelings of, well, this is just a flash in the pan. It's like, this is the only sale I'm ever gonna get or did it just start to ramp up kind of from there? No, I, I had, I just had so much faith that it was going to work. Um, I didn't know how fast and I didn't know what I was doing, 
but it, mm. it had to work, right? So like my wife and I, for context, we were on food stamps for 18 months. I had my like family oh, members wow. sending me money. It was like the most embarrassing, lowest part of my life because I had felt like, you know, yeah, I'm 26. I have a kid. Where am I going with my life? I have a college degree. I should just go work at a grocery store. Why am I blogging about audio recording? This is dumb. But um, it had to work because I, I felt like I had to prove myself right. I felt like I, I didn't want to go back to a, a cubicle. I didn't want to go back to wearing a shirt and tie. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, it, if, if it could work, it would be worth fighting for. So I just, I spent all my time creating as much content on YouTube as possible because it stoked the flames. It, it was creating a little movement in that little audio niche. And that drove people to the email list. And that, that allowed me to create, I created multiple courses. I tried a bunch of different topics, different price points. It took me about two years to finally hit a course that my audience really connected with. Um, and the audience was also growing at that time after a year and a half of creating content three or four times mm -hmm. a week. And that's when I knew like, this is going to be a full-time income. Like I think we made $60,000 in my second year. And I was like, it's wow. game over. Like I, I'm a happy camper and we could, we could see how this could grow even more if I really pressed into it. That's really amazing. So 60 grand in a year after a couple of years. And thank you for providing that context. You know, a lot of people hear these stories and they're like, oh my gosh, you were an overnight success, but it sounds like it did take a slow churn to make this happen. But then, you know, that exponential growth, especially on YouTube can, can happen, you know, rather quickly. I mean, to create something from nothing in two years like this is, is really amazing. How big was the audience at this point on your email list when you were making 60 grand a year? And also how much reach were you getting on, on YouTube just so we can get some perspective? Yeah. So I think like after my first year, I might've had a, like a thousand people on my email list. Um, and that was like me making again, like three pieces of content a week, every week for a year, um, yeah, one video, two blog posts. So I was just, and I just, I was laid off. So I had time. So I did that. And then I think year two, I had 7,000 people on my email list and it was by the end of the year. And that's when I kind of, most of the revenue came in the last six months of that year um, mm -hmm. after I launched that other course. So it was, you know what it's like with content where it's this steady grind. And I, when I, I'm coaching people now with their businesses, right? And they'll tell me, I'm, just, I'm doing everything you're saying. I'm posting consistently, no growth. And I'm like, well, how long have you been doing it? You know, six months, three months, yeah, three months. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, man, if you go, if you look at my YouTube data or email list data, it looks like nothing's happening. And then year and a half into two years, you start to see the hockey stick. And in year three, like that was the magical year where I wasn't doing anything new, but year three, we doubled to like 140 K that year wow. just by continuing to be faithfully consistently publishing content because it was people share and the algorithm favors and things start to pick up when but it's slow, right? And that's why it's hard. I think the first couple of years are a grind for people just because you don't see the quick results. Not some people do. I'm envious of yeah. those people, but not me. It, most people, it doesn't happen like that. And, and so I'm, again, grateful for this real story. Before we move on to the next phase of what happened and how you got into business coaching and the kinds of things that are working today, uh, I'd love to know for your courses from the audio engineering stuff, how are, uh, people were finding your video how were they getting into the courses? You, you had mentioned an email list. Was there a lead magnet? Like what was that process to get them eventually to, to a sale? Yeah, that was the one thing I learned early on. And I think I just ran a, read a simple article somewhere about like, hey, you got to get them into an email list. And the only way mm -hmm. to do that is to give them value, which I love. I mean, generosity like drives everything I do. And, and so I was like, okay. So I, early on, I was giving out an ebook, I think. I think it was called like the number one rule of home recording. It was an ebook, which it wasn't, it wasn't even that great, but, but it was like, it was one simple idea fleshed out and it was a counterintuitive idea and it was juicy enough that people said, Oh, I want to read that. I want to check that out. And so I was building an email list. And then from there, it was just a simple funnel. I mean, it, I wouldn't even call it a funnel, but it's like five emails. Mm -hmm. It would teach them some more stuff and then it would offer my course and they would buy my course. And, and then I added to that as I added more courses, but that's pretty much been like content driving the lead magnet to the email list. Then they read some emails and they see that they're valuable and then they have an opportunity to buy. Doesn't sound too complicated. No, it's, it's pretty <laughs> simple. Yeah, that's great. And so this brand, like, does this brand still exist? I know it was a while back, but is it still around? Where can people find it? The audio engineering stuff? Yeah, so it's called The Recording Revolution. It still exists. Um, about a year ago, um, I stepped out from being the content creator. So I did it for 11 years straight. Um, and then 
Um, I have a, I have a partner in that business now who was on the marketing side, but now he's, he's really kind of bringing on other personalities as it were to teach the material. And this is sort of like a necessary step for me. I was running two businesses for about three years and I really just felt a call and a shift to like, I have to go all in on this business coaching brand that I never thought I would. There's a lot of stuff there we can unpack in terms of identity with my first brand and this is who I was. And, but yeah, it yeah. still exists. It's just not me anymore. I'm just, I'm just the CEO and I'm behind the scenes, but it's people still find it and they still get value out of it. So we want to continue to serve them. Just, I just can't be the guy to do it anymore. I'd love to know about that transition, actually. Uh, it's a perfect transition. And as far as your own identity, I mean, to have a brand under your belt for 10 plus years, I mean, similar to me, Pat Flynn is very much tied to Smart Passive Income for the longest time. And now it's a lot more than that. It's a much bigger team. We have SPI Pro. It's really about the community now, not just me. But what was the push and pull for you then? What was the, the drive to remove yourself as the content creator as the face? But what was also like, if anything, making that very difficult for you? So the drive was, I, I just wasn't as passionate about music recording as I once was. Um, mm -hmm. The music led to this business where I kind of fell into online business. The business changed my life in two ways. One, financially, never thought I could make this kind of money as a musician. Number two, it showed me a new love, which is business. And speci specifically a business that like empowers your lifestyle to love your family well and love your friends well and take care of yourself and have time, right? It's, it's the things we love, right? That's what this podcast is all about. Um, mm -hmm. So that love grew so much that I was like, I am bursting at the seams to talk about this. And I know there's other people talking about it, but I feel like I, I just, it needs, I need an outlet. So I started a business coaching brand just to have an outlet. And then it grew and my love for it grew. And I early on realized, okay, I, I could just do both. But then the problem was my passion for music sort of diminished and diminished and diminished. And I was like, man, I feel pretty disingenuous. Like making a video about music recording used to be the, the highlight of my day. And now mm -hmm. it's not. I'm doing it because I need to keep the content schedule going. I need to, the language I would use is feed the beast. And, yeah. and, and it printed money and it was, took care of my family. But I just had a crisis of like, I don't know if like, nobody knows I'm good on camera. I can, I can show up and do it. And I could teach this stuff in, this, in my sleep, but I just didn't feel good. Like I would go to bed feeling like, dude, these people are so excited about this stuff and I'm not anymore. Mm -hmm. And then that scared me because that was who I was like my whole life. So yeah, man, I, I felt like I had to step away to be, to be transparent and to be gen a genuine person. But it was really, really hard because that's how I was known in my world. And in, to myself, I identified as a musician. Yeah. Well, that's incredible. And thank you for being vulnerable and open about that. I think that's very relatable, especially for, for me. Uh, but moving into the business coaching stuff, tell me about how you eventually got clients for that and how that all began. Because if your audience was all audio engineering and, and recording and people mastering and mixing, how, where did you get business clients from? Yeah, so in 2015, I think, there, I started to get some press on me nationally about like, here, here's this music guy. He started a business and he's making this amount of money. And, and, um, and so when the, a couple of articles dropped on me, all of a sudden I got all this attention from outside the music space and people are like, Oh, hmm. cool. How do, how are you doing what you're doing? I'm not, I don't care about music, but I want to turn my, you know, fitness gym into an online business. How do I do that? So it, that was the year I was like, Oh, people are interested in this from me. And I started coaching people you know, behind the scenes one-on-one. -on -one. And that was when I had that itch to, I, I felt like I wanted to do what I did with the recording revolution was to, I wanted to create a resource online where I could dump all my thoughts, all the ways I think about business. Um, and so that's when I launched GrahamCochran.com in 2018 to just put myself out there and teach what I know. Uh, same model, content marketing. Everything I do is organic. I don't, I haven't paid for ads in 12 years. Um, it's all content you know, I, I'd reach out to friends and family, people that follow me on Facebook, like, Hey, I'm, I'm a business coach now, which was super, again, su for me, super awkward because mm -hmm. a, this space is a really big space with really Huge. great names in this space. And, and as I, let me just say, like, you're one of the good guys in this space. So I'm grateful for people Thank like you. you. I think I a lot it. of the people in this space, I'm ashamed to be associated with. And most people don't know maybe me as well as, as, as well, as well as they will, but like, I'm like, Oh, do I really want to get in that space? Cause I know who was in that space and yeah, I would hate exactly. to be, at the same table with them, no offense to them. I just don't want to, but, but I felt this call to, to actually, 
you know, be light in darkness, as it were, and displace mm -hmm. um, some of the, the, the darkness in this space and just be a, a voice. So I felt like I had to, but I was scared. I was nervous. Uh, fears of like, hey, do I have anything original to bring to the business coaching space? It's pretty, pretty crushing. People are crushing it right now. Plenty of good voices. Is, it, um, is there any people left that truly need help or are they getting all the help? seems very saturated. So all those typical things that new content business owners have, which is, oh, it's crowded. It's already been done before. I'm not original. But all the same imposter syndrome things I, I teach my people to not, not believe I was believing in this second brand. But, you know, just starting to create content, YouTube. YouTube is, is a glorious thing, man. I mean, again, slow build. Yep. Uh, that first year I published a video every single week. And then one of the videos finally picked up and it had to do with like, starting an LLC or a sole proprietor. It was like one random video that popped and then more people found other videos. And so you know how it is. You have those 80, 20, maybe it's more like 99, one, like the one, yeah. two percent of videos <laughs> that drive all those leads, but they come eventually if you're consistent and that started to pick up speed and it's been a, it's been a glorious ride so far. That's really cool. And so, you know, coaching is very different than creating content. How were those first experiences for you to get coaching in place and discovering yourself as a coach and what that was like? Because there's there's a there's a there's an art form to it, right? How did you become a you know a, a great coach? I don't know if I'm a great coach. I, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm actually literally in a coaching group right now by a great coach to help me become a better coach. Specifically, I want to learn how meta. to ask better <laughs> questions. Yeah, I know. I want to learn how to ask better questions because I'm a I'm a communicator first. Mm -hmm. So by coach, that language is how I view myself because I feel like I'm supposed to come alongside people and empower them because people need information. They need to know how to do the thing, but they need to feel like they can actually do the thing, right? Right. And that's what's missing in so much information products out there. It's like, here's how you do it. But do the people walk away from your video or your course or your membership site or whatever and feel like, not only do I know how, but I could see myself actually doing it. And I feel motivated to do it. I think I'm good at that second part, maybe more than even just having unique information. So I try to do that in my videos and my podcast, but with, you know, with coaching clients, that's something that I started. I started out with coaching clients one-on-one -on -one and I learned a lot more. I almost used coaching as an opportunity to learn what do people who are either already successful and they want help growing because a lot of people hired me to help them scale mm -hmm. or people who are stuck getting started, what do they struggle with? So I just use it to research. Um, I was really surprised at what people wanted out of business. I, I figured it was dollars. I figured it was a certain, yeah, like what those dollars could afford them to do lifestyle wise. But it really was like a lot of things that I want time, um, slow, like they want to slow down. They just want to be able to slow down. They want to be able to be present as a husband, father, wife, mother, um, and mm -hmm. so a lot of that I've learned and tried to incorporate into the language of um, on my brand is like, I'm not trying to just help you build a business. I'm trying to help you live more, give more to the things and people you care about, have like find your lane in life where you feel like you're actually thriving. And so that was interesting to learn that other people were interested in that too. I don't think everyone is. So I get some people think like this guy is not really that interesting to me, but for the people that want that, they connect. And so I feel like I just try to bring that and empower them to believe that they can do that, whether it's through a video or through one-on-one -on -one coaching. Yeah, I feel that. And, and, and I know that you've put a lot of yourself into this new book that you have that just came out a couple months ago at the time of this recording being published. What's the name of the book? Where can people get it? What's it about? Yeah, it's called How to Get Paid for What You Know. <laughs> Not the most creative title, but pretty straightforward. It's clear. The subtitle <laughs> is uh, tur Turning Your Knowledge, Passion, and Experience into an Online Income Stream in Your Spare Time. And the thesis is pretty simple. I really believe that everyone is sitting on a gold mine of an idea. Everyone has something that they think is normal, um, and pretty ordinary to them that is extraordinary to someone else. Mm. Uh, and all, all we're doing in this space is getting paid to share what we're good at, what we know, what we've helped people do in the past. And I, in the book, try to tell a little bit of my story to show people that like, hey, I, I wasn't an entrepreneur, didn't know anything about entrepreneurship, but then quickly move on to here's the opportunity we have right now in this knowledge economy. It's an insane time to be alive. People think, oh, it's, you know, it's past. I, I don't think it's past. I think we're at the beginning of a 30, 40 year wave of where this is going to be how people engage with information and, and grow their skill sets. And so I think now's a great time to just systematize what you know and put it into an, an automated system. So I walk them through the six steps to build the business, launch it, automate it, 
And then if they want to scale it from there, they totally can, whether it's just, Hey, I want to make an extra thousand or two a month, pretty, pretty passively, or I want to go full time on this thing. Nice. I love it. I agree. I think it's a perfect time. I mean, we saw this coming out of the pandemic, a lot of people getting laid off, a lot of people, you know, soul searching, looking for a new direction in their life. And we need as much, not just information, but inspiration and people out there like yourself, uh, like me, like many others who are good people in this space to, to step up and, and serve those people. I want to, you know, we'll put the links to the books and everything else that you have to offer on our show notes page. And, and again, thank you for mentioning that. But in terms of your process to help somebody who literally is on a walk right now, or they're at the gym and they know they have something inside of them, but they're not quite sure what it might be, or they're having those self doubts. What is your process? I've taught my process many times here. I've written books about it as well, but I, I want to highlight your process for taking somebody who is literally starting from scratch and maybe thinks to themselves, yeah, I, I might have something, but I have no idea what it is. And I don't even know if it's going to work. How do you, how do you coach that person through to building something and, and creating potentially something come down the road? Yeah. I mean, the most important part of it, all of it is the idea, right? Like, what are yep. you going to build the business around and do it? Does anybody care? You know, mm -hmm. so I think there's two parts to that, right? Everyone has a lot of interests. You know, I see, you know, Stormtrooper, you know, helmet on the back of your, your thing. I was at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge this weekend, um, nice. hanging out with Stormtroopers. And so Star Wars, like that's a passion you have. Um, so that's great. Put it on the list. Can you monetize it? I don't know. We, you know, you probably could, but it just depends. So it's like you, you figure out what do you like? figure out what do you, what do you like, what literally do you know things about? Um, and people again, really have a hard time because like, oh, I don't know anything. Well, you know, you know things. What well, I ask people, what if, what do people come to you and ask you for help with? Like for whatever reason, people ask me, Hey Graham, can you help me like put together a budget like, help me get started investing in my, my retirement account? Like for whatever reason, words gotten out in my little community, like, well, Graham likes to, he's helpful with his money. He can help you with his money. So people come to me. So in theory, if I were starting over, I'd be like, huh, maybe I could make a business helping people with their money. What have you helped people in the past do? What do people ask you for help with? What do people say you're good at? Even mm -hmm. if those things are boring to you, just write them down. And then of course, write the things you're very interested in. I, that list for me would include eating pizza, football, Star Wars, you know, personal finance, all those things. I'd write all those things down. And that's interesting and good and all, but, and that's, you have to start there because I think this kind of business, you have to really be passionate about it. Some businesses you could own and it can run and you don't have to care about the product necessarily, but for this kind of business to work, you really have to think, could I talk about this for 10 years and enjoy right. it for 10 years? So yeah, you start there, right? But like Mike Rose says, like, you know, you, you don't follow your passion, right? But always bring it with you. So it is important to bring it with you, but really it's about what's marketable. Mm -hmm. And so that's the second part of it. Where does that intersect with what, what are people already paying for? Are people are paying for things having to do with Star Wars? I mean, gosh, I was on a Disney, like a mousehacker.com the other day, like trying to figure out how, what's the best way to show up at Disney Hollywood Studios and like get to Rise of Resistance before it breaks or people, the line's three hours long. And I'm like, this person's got a lead magnet for this Disney checklist for your itinerary. I'm just loving the business model. So they found a way to monetize their love of Disney, but you have to know, are other people interested in this? Are people buying books on this? Are they spending money on this? And if so, you can find a cross section between what you're good at, what's marketable. Even if you don't understand how to monetize it yet, mm -hmm. you don't want to get ahead of yourself. You just want to find what is that, where is there an intersection that you could tease out and then do some research on and find out what keeps people up at night around that topic. Yeah, I love that. I mean, putting all those ideas out there is really important. Even if they seem like bad ideas, you might find that there's some good combination between a couple of those ideas, or you might find that as soon as you put them on paper, you're like, that's a ridiculous idea. And then boom, you could throw it away. It's out of your brain now. And you can make more room for other things with the stormtrooper helmet that you see behind me. I was thinking about the same thing. And, you know, a lot of people are looking for information about how to save time when they go to Disney and you just prop that up. And, and it's cool to see that there's businesses, there's YouTube channels about this kind of stuff. There's YouTube channels about the Disney lore and old rides that are no longer available that my son and my wife watch all the time. Uh, I could potentially start a business on Etsy, right? Taking stormtrooper helmets that are white like this one behind me and then either coloring them or spray painting them a certain color or making them themed on, maybe there's a Squid Games stormtrooper helmet that I could <laughs> sort of commission from. So I don't know, you yeah. never know, right? And then Absolutely. you just maybe create create one and see what happens and and you never know, things might happen from there. Now, when it comes to maybe you have an idea and it's like, okay, this might take, What's the next step from there? Because that's often the time where that little voice inside of our head goes, 
you're not qualified to do that or you've never done that before or there's other people doing way better or have already done that before you. Why are you even trying to do that? How do you combat that voice in, in our heads? Dude, that is the thing that keeps people from doing stuff. Like you nail on oh, the head, like who am I to do this? That's the internal question. Mm. And man, and people are different because right, it depends on your, your scheme and how you grew up. Some people genuinely struggle with this in all aspects of life. They view life through the lens of like, who am I to do anything? And so there might be some deeper soul work that that person needs as opposed to someone who mm. has a lot more confidence naturally from their personality or the way they were raised. But if without going into the depth there, because I'm not, I'm not a therapist, but it's like, man, who, who is anybody to do anything? That's the first question. Like, A, we're all just humans. Everyone had to start somewhere. And at the end of the day, I, the way I look at it is, I don't think people care if you're an expert or not. I think only you care. Like, so when you're like, who am I to do this? It's a very narcissistic question, if I'm going to be honest. You're, you're looking inward at like, gosh, mm -hmm. I'm not good enough and I need to be an expert. I think you'll get further in life if you stop looking at yourself and instead look at how could I serve somebody? Could I help somebody? Uh, could I help them get a little bit farther than where they are? Uh, I don't know a ton about um, like fitness or nutrition, but I've learned a lot in the last three years since I've gotten really serious about both, that there is a possibility that I could help some people who have never worked out before or never considered how to eat. I could get them a lot farther than they are just by what I know. And I'm not a credentialed expert and I don't have like cool letters after my name. And that's how I mm -hmm. felt with the music space. Like I didn't, I, I had an audio engineering degree technically, but I wasn't, here's, here's what I got told. I, on Facebook groups, that back in the day, there would be a, people blasting me because as I started to, as my channel started to blow up in that space, again, audio engineering is a small niche. It's gotten a lot bigger on YouTube. But mm -hmm. I was at the time, if, if not still, like one of the largest players in that space. And there would be people that would say, who is this guy? Why, yeah. why, why is the recording revolution so popular? Who has he recorded that I know? Does he have a Grammy award? And there were mm -hmm. some haters that would say that kind of stuff. And it, it was hard because my insecurity was, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have a Grammy. All my clients are indie artists. You've never heard of them. Um, the only credibility I have is when I teach you something and you go implement it, you get results. And to me, I had to make peace with, can I help people? Are they getting results? Even if it's one person and that's mm. my credibility and that's my permission to go help another person. And you have to kind of tune everything else out. Is that the kind of coaching you offer to others who are getting started and they're like, I don't know if I'm going to do this. And is, is the one result for one person a great strategy to get started with? I think it is because that's all we're doing on a mass scale, right? Is mm. helping people. So I think it's proof of concept. If A, there's people that need this help, right? And that's most important. It goes back to the idea thing. And that's where are there affinity groups on you know, Facebook and other places? Are there YouTube channels on this already? Anytime you see it already happening, that's a good sign that there's that's a need there. But then if there is... Like talk to real people and, and mm -hmm. find out like what's been your biggest struggle with X or what's your biggest hope or desire as it relates to your fitness or your nutrition or your parenting or whatever it is and get their real words and, and have deep conversations. And I think if you can help somebody, one person get results, A, that'll give you a boost of confidence, but B, then that's the exact same thing that like you and I are doing on a mass scale you know, using content to reach more people that maybe we don't get personal interactions with every one of them, but it's the exact same concept. And it's that true value add that if you can do that with a person, then you're going to win online because there's plenty of people who can get in front of an audience online, but they have nothing of value to add. So then it, it doesn't work or if it works, it only works for a moment until people realize this is just garbage. So yeah, you're just helping more people do the exact same thing you would do one-to-one. -one. Love it. Now, since you're a business coach, I think it might be interesting if we do a little role playing. Sure. Can I come at you with a business that's kind of maybe just got off the ground, but it's kind of struggling. You can coach me through how to, how to scale that up. Let's do it. Okay. So I have a brand online. It has a blog and a YouTube channel similar to you, but I help people run marathons and their first marathons typically. Uh, and it's going okay. I have an ebook that, helps people with a training program. A lot of my top performing videos are about, uh, you know, nutrition for marathon training, you know, a eight to 10 week plan to help people get to that point where they can eventually run their first marathon. But I'm only making like three sales uh, a week. You know, it's not bad, but every other day I might get a sale and some days I wake up and I don't see any sales. 
And, you know, I just don't, I don't know what to do from here. There's a lot of other people who seem to be owning the marathon training space. And I'm just kind of like a little guy who has run my first marathon. My friends asked me how to do it. And I put together this program, but it's not, it's not really getting anywhere, man. Like Graham, how do you, how do you scale from here? Where do I go from here? Yeah. So can I ask clarifying questions? As you, as any good coach would. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. So how much content are you producing and how often and, wh- and where is it? Is it just on YouTube? It's on my blog and on my YouTube once a week on each, basically. And they're, they're usually around the same kinds of topics that you would expect in the marathon space. And sometimes it's about reviews for shoes. And I do have some affiliate income come from things like that. Uh, but it's, it's generally just, you know, training tips and whatnot once a week on each of those channels. Great job. I love that you're reviewing shoes already. Um, and what is it you sell? Is it just the ebook or do you have anything else? It's just an ebook with a training program and there's also a bonus sort of dietary program that can, that comes along with it. And how much does it cost? Uh, 29.99. Okay. So, right. There's two things I would say. There's two levers you could pull, right. To grow. One would be move away from that low price point of a $29 ebook as your core offer and turn it into a course that could be 99 or 149 or, or more. And it could be the exact same material, but presented in a video course where they can leave comments and you can answer their comments. And maybe there's a, some bonus areas with all kinds of downloadables and stuff, but the value is the value perception is much higher if it's a video course. So that way, if you are making three sales here and there, instead of a $29 sale, it could be $149 sale. Uh, And then, so there's, and then obviously you could add more products. So what else do people need? Um, Do they need something before that ebook? Do they need something after that ebook? Could they, mm. could they want community? A, a lot of people that bought my products early on liked them and then they felt like they had no accountability or people to talk to about it. So could you create a community for them that they pay every month a small fee to be a part of? So there's that dial, the That's product great. dial, crank it up. And then on the, the content, I love that you're posting once a week to YouTube. If you can post more, be as prolific as you can. If you can't, I'm not opposed to once a week, but I would say who else who has a big, or bigger YouTube channel could you connect with that's maybe a complimentary niche to you? So maybe it's not all the other marathoners that are teaching the same thing, although you might find some friends. And I I like to view everyone as a collaborator or potential collaborator, not competition. But most Mm -hmm. of them are are gonna be territorial and say no, maybe. But is there someone else in a fitness niche that's not necessarily just for runners um, who or people who are beginner runners that then you could partner with and you could be the expert on marathons and you could create some exclusive content for them and their audience that might be interesting and then you can hijack that, their audience that's the language I like to use is someone already else has built an audience so why don't you get in front of them and siphon some of them over to what you're doing and those two de- levers if you dial them up you'll be on your way to scaling your income and then your reach which will scale your income as well love it i know this is a small session and typically you be working with people for a lot longer and go a little bit deeper but i like the direction i like the, i like the way you're thinking about this in terms of well i could create more content which would bring more people into the funnels or I could work on the product side. And I think the product side would make the most sense to start out with because I do feel like a lot of my audience is selling products at similar prices and, sh- and should be creating courses and should be going a lot higher in price point. A big pushback I get with that, that maybe we can get back into the role play is, Graham, well, if I charge more, wouldn't that mean I'm like leaving a whole bunch of people out that might not be, be able to afford that? Like I want to help as many people as possible. That's why I price this so low. Yeah, that's how I felt as well. Um, I've learned a lot from just experimenting with this, right? I've learned low price products, no offense to anyone. This is not a blanket statement, but my experience has been low, low price products bring lower quality customers mm-hmm. who aren't really serious and they're not really committed. So I found, I, for example, I had a product that was really five mini courses and I wanted to let people buy them individually if they wanted because they're on different topics, but they all go together. So you can either buy the bundle for $69, which is still low price. It should have been more, but, or you could buy them individually for 17 little mini courses. And I found after a year of launching this product that the people that bought the $17 ones, that's where all my refund requests came from. Mm. And anyone who bought the bundle for 69, almost zero refunds. And so I thought, well, what if I just get rid of the $17 option and force people to have to buy them all at 69? Would would people complain? Would I still get sales? I I made more money because people were like, well, I'll just get the bundle then. 
and then nobody complained and nobody refunded or few people did. And I realized I was attracting the wrong kind of customer for one. Mm. And that's huge. And even though you want to help everybody, you really don't. You don't want to help everybody. You only want to help people who are serious about wanting help. And people that are going to throw five, ten dollars here and there aren't really serious. They're not sure yet. And they might need someone else to help them or they might need to come to a place where they're actually ready for transformation. Like when like Dave Ramsey says, when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's when you actually get transformation. And so I would rather have a course that's a little bit more higher priced, a little bit more aspirational, because people can find a way to buy anything they want. They we do it all the time. That's why we have a crazy deficit and debts all over the place. I'm not saying people should yeah. go into debt for your products, but if they want it, they'll find a way. And it's really your job to communicate the value of it and then attract your ideal customer. I love that. That's so true about the kind of customers you attract at that price level. And the other thing that I often say when people share that with me is, well, you're not leaving those people out because those people have all of your amazing free content to get access to. Love that. Right? But for the people who, like you said, are committed, who are serious, they're going to need a higher price point to feel the impact and also feel like their skin in the game. So I, I, I love that solution. And then the other thing is like, you know, I'm helping people run a marathon. What's the first step? Maybe it's running the 5k. Maybe that's a challenge. Maybe that's a lead magnet, or maybe there is a, another product in there. That's for the first step of 5k. We'll get to the marathon later. Cause that's such a big ask. So uh, thank you for role-playing with me on that. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I love that style. And, Dude, there's just so much we could unpack here, but I think people should go and check out your book if they want to get the step-by-step. -step. Where uh, can they go get the book? What's the name of it once again? Yeah, the book's called How to Get Paid for What You Know, and it's available anywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you buy books. And if you want, I do have uh, bonuses that I was offering for pre-order, but I'll, I'll still give you bonuses. If you go to grahamcochran.com slash book and bring your receipt there from wherever you bought it, we'll get you $100 worth of bonuses, some audio training, and a bunch of other goodies as well. Awesome. Any final words of advice for those who are in the audience who are just starting out or who are in the same boat as their our marathon trainer? Uh, what's one piece of motivation you can offer before we, we head out today? Yeah, I would say if you're like me, I would set, I like big goals, but I like realistic goals. Like it's overwhelming when you see people making a ton of money online and you're not getting enough traction. So I would set yourself little mini goals that are, right for you and just hit mm -hmm. those and celebrate the heck out of those because you need that internal motivation to stay in this business long enough to get to pat like your level you just have to be in the game long enough and you will burn out if you're discouraged because you're not reaching someone else's goal that you're not really ready to reach yet so be patient okay. to your point it's a marathon not a sprint so i love it like pace yourself don't burn out. The world needs what you have to offer. So set up your business in such a way that you can stay in it for a long, long time. Awesome. So GrahamCochran.com, check out the book on Amazon and we'll have all the links on the show notes and everything. Graham, thank you so much for coming in today. The inspiration, the knowledge. Uh, I appreciate you. It's my pleasure, Pat. Thanks. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Graham Cochran. Again, if you pick up his book, you can go to GrahamCochran.com slash book to get uh, some bonuses, which is really cool. That was a nice surprise. Graham, super inspirational. And I'm so, so so excited to hear what people think about this episode because your story very much parallels mine and includes a lot of the same things that helped me early on that I know can help people who are here listening uh, or watching this right now. So thank you again so much, GrahamCochran.com. You can get all the links and resources that were mentioned in this episode at the show notes page at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 579. Again, smartpassiveincome.com slash session 579. I think this is an episode that a lot of people are gonna talk about and hopefully a lot of people connect with Graham too because he's obviously a great, great person with a nice heart who is here to serve you. And uh, I also love when people come in and they talk about a success story that doesn't involve them just like teaching business right away, but they started with a success story underneath their belt first. Um, that was very important when I started. Uh, and, and Graham obviously has his story about uh, his recording revolution and everything that went down in the audio engineering space. So that was really cool to see. And I, I just love his open transparency with relation to his transition and how that felt. I think a lot of people could relate to that as well. And uh, I just love this. Episode. This was so much fun. Graham, thank you so much. I appreciate you for listening all the way through. And if you want to make sure you get episodes like this in the future and not miss out, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And again, thank you for all of the reviews that have been coming in. I read them all. Just super grateful for the response to not just episodes like this, but the entire podcast in general. 
appreciate that so much. And make sure you check out SPI Pro. That's where entrepreneurs hang out and help each other out. And we offer events and challenges and support and accountability in there. If you want to check it out and apply and see if it's the right fit for you, you can go to spipro.com and fill out an app. And we hope to see you in there. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I look forward to serving you in the next episode. Until then, peace out. Cheers. And as always, Team Flynn for the win. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income podcast at smartpassiveincome.com. I'm your host, Pat Flynn. Our senior producer is Sarah Jane Hess. Our series producer is David Grabowski. And our executive producer is Matt Gartland. Sound and video editing by Sean West Media. The Smart Passive Income podcast is a production of SPI Media. We'll catch you in the next session. Hey, have you ever wondered what makes the difference between a one and a five-star review? Well, turn into Behind the Review, a phenomenal podcast from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. Each week, Yelp's small business expert, Emily Washkovic, features a different conversation with a different reviewer or business owner to find out what was really going on, as the title suggests, behind the review. Recently, for example, Emily featured an episode about Aldea Country Eatery, the number five spot in the world on Yelp's top 100 places to eat. Emily interviews a wide variety of customers and business owners from a wide variety of industries, tabletop gaming companies, the fitness industry, you name it. This is a really fascinating peek into what makes a great customer experience for any business and you won't want to miss out. So listen to Behind the Review right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.